doing that. So this is the real struggle here has been how do we turn it into like this is a huge project and, and what, what is interesting, what's going to be useful and valuable for you guys. I've tried to focus on some of the tools that we've used. Um, and um, Rich is going to talk about some of the technology and tools that, that he's used and some of the some of the in the weeds um, um, kind of library side of processing. So um, I'm going to do that and then any minute now we're going to have some pictures and it's going to be cool and awesome. Um, so the collection started life, I guess, maybe three or four years ago in the library. Um, we are super um, grateful um, for um, the Amplifier website and, and, and the kind of underlying company called DRM um, for um, them helping us with this project. So the idea was like there's a whole bunch of published music in New Zealand and it's being distributed through the Amplifier website. Um, we want to ingest it as part of the legal deposit collection. We don't really want to go and, awesome, thank you. We don't really want to go and harvest um, the website. I mean, we could do, but um, that's going to take forever. Um, and um, we haven't got time for that. And, and so in the end, they kind of said, well, look, why don't we just give you a hard drive with it all on? So we got a hard drive, um, and it was um, 2.6 2 terabytes. Um, on this side, closest to me, that's, that's a, um, um, a, a screen dump of a, of a tool that I use quite a lot to analyze data stores. It's called WinDRStat. And each one of those blocks is clusters of files that are similar. The colors are the same. The size is the, is the kind of bytes, number of bytes. Um, and it's kind of quite chaotic. You can see some regular stuff at the top, and then it just kind of descends into what looks like, frankly, madness. Um, and I guess the closest equiv equivalence I could find was, was this you know, kind of semi-well-organized piles of stuff. Um, and that's not to besmirch what they were doing. It was dumps out of two different CMSs. There was some human stuff in there, 160,000 files, all out of a Mac OS. Um, so there was a whole bunch of like resource forks and files that did nothing for us really. Um, there was promo pictures and audio and um, a few bits of video, relatively well organized, like pseudo sane, um, you know, label artist um, um, work, to, you know, album, EP, single, whatever, and track. Um, but, but we kind of needed to do a bit of work to turn it into something else. And there were zip files in there as well. So it's just kind of like this big, here you go, here's two and a half terabytes, go and make it into library stuff. Um, and so that's kind of what we wanted to look like. And this side, this is, this is the same tool showing the processed SIP. So this is the, the submission ingest package, what we ingest. And each of these kind of blocks broadly represents um, one of those items as we ingested it into the collection. So this is basically a story of how we went from, from this kind of like organized, working, active BAU into something that we can kind of deal with in library land. Um, so kind of my part in this job has been to kind of, I don't know, figure it out. Um, I, I could talk at length about even just moving the 2.6 terabytes onto corporate storage uh, sanely um, and counting everything and making sure everything was there um, the third time around when we did it. And every time takes about four days and I don't know, life's hard sometimes in the public sector. Um, so we had like hard drives on a file. We've got phase one. There was this awesome spreadsheet in there which had a whole bunch of tracks listed individually. So we knew a whole bunch of context about some of the content. Um, and then, so that was phase one. And then we had a whole bunch of separate spreadsheets. Um, um, as you can see, like one and a half thousand of them. Um, and, and then we had a whole bunch of stuff that was like, I don't know, there's just a bunch of stuff, get on with it. Um, so for each of these phases, we had to like identify every item. This, this song that exists conceptually on this, on this spreadsheet, there's a corresponding file for it. And on that album that's described by tracks, there's all those tracks are available, we've got them all, and there's an image, maybe or not an image, and just kind of basically just trying to sift it through a net and trying to turn it into something sane. Um, we wanted to identify the right ones because it'd be kind of bad if we got the wrong ones. Um, we need to make records, and, and Rich is going to talk to you about that process because, frankly, for me, that's the magical bit. Um, we need to look for dupes. Um, uh, dupes were the biggest thing of this project. Uh, I'll talk about that in a bit more in a second. And then in the end, kind of turn the handle, package them up real neat, and then just send them off to the mechanical stuff. So. Um, for me, it was, a, it was a project of tool building. We know what we want to do. We roughly know how we want to get there. Um, but we just kind of don't have the tools to do it often in this sector. We don't have a lot of money. We don't have a lot of dev support. Um, those of you who might have seen me talk occasionally will, help, will, will have heard me describe learning Python because I realized no one was coming to save me. Um, and this kind of growing pile of things I needed to do was not getting any smaller. Um, and, and that's kind of like Python is the one trick pony that I use all the time to solve all my problems in the world ever. Um, sometimes not very successfully. Um, so, so we've just built a heap of different tools. I'm going to talk about a few of them now. 
Um, this one was a, um, a fixity tool. So this is just like, these are screen grabs, but this thing just floats on my desktop and it helped me really dealing with um, fixity file fixity. So R2 files bitwise identical. I could run logs and I could, I could kind of do comparisons that way, but I'm unpacking zips and I'm checking whether this version of that file is the same version as that file. Do I need to keep them both? And I made this little widget that I can just kind of drop a file onto it and drop another file onto it and I'll go, yeah, man, they're the same, don't worry about it. Or like, oh, no, they're different. You need to keep both of them. Um, and so that didn't exist. I made it, it does now. Um, you can use it if you want, it's on GitHub and stuff. It's, it's pretty naff, um, but it does the job. Um, so I use that quite a lot. Um, Deduping, de we've talked about, Rich is gonna talk about fuzzy um, and how we use fuzzy logic heaps to help us do a bunch of deduping. Um, my favorite thing that we did in, de I mean, deduping was the biggest, maddest thing of this whole project. So we packaged a whole bunch of stuff in phase one. We go to phase two. We need to make sure we don't have an existing item. We, make sure we, we, we need to make sure we haven't packaged the same thing twice in this phase and in a previous phase. Um, and so Richard and I must have spent weeks, days, um, deduping manually. I, it was interesting listening to um, Chris talk on his keynote on, on yesterday, talking about the human effort. We built tools, we automated a whole bunch of stuff, but we also spend a lot of time humanly dragging and moving stuff around. So one of the ways of deduping images that we came up with was take all the images, turn them down into 64 by 64 pixel images, and then do a pairwise comparison for their RMSE, their, their root mean square error between two images. And if you get a zero, they're probably the same image. And so having humanly deduped thousands of things and found lots of logical dupes and lots of fixed dupes and lots of fuzzy dupes, we still at the end of the project found dupes by using weird, not, not, not sensible kind of methods. It kind of like told us that there's, there's something in this duping problem. Anyway, we're, we're making up tools as we go along. Um, this was probably my favorite part. Um, because of the transfer problem, it took me forever to move everything. So we ended up, and I borrowed this, I say borrowed, I, I very, very plainly stole this from the um, kind of broadcasting world, where we make like a low res offline copy, uh, a low res online copy that we can edit and we can move those files around elegantly because they're small and compact. And I did that for the whole file system. And that means that I can process at a file file name level. Um, and then I just kind of trap those instructions and then I can replay them on the live collection. And it meant that I could rehearse maneuvers and I could see what happens when I do deletes and renames and moves. And I can hand off the collection to other colleagues. We had a contractor doing some deduping for us. And it meant I could give him the entire collection on a memory stick without any fear of compromising the intellectual property because it doesn't exist. All the files in the shadow collection are nothing. There's nothing in them. It's just a file with a file name. But he could do the deduping against the file name about the structure give me those instructions back and I replay it on the main collection and bingo, like we've, we've done this real nice way of, of, of dealing with kind of like instruction compression. Again, it's on GitHub, you're more than welcome to have a go, it's naff, but you know, it saved us weeks and weeks and weeks of effort. Um, and then for me, the other tool that we had was philosophical. And this is my, my kind of last slide for a hand to Richard. Um, I was trying to find another way of saying perfect is the enemy of good. Um, and I ended on um, this guy, um, and what's and what, and he was uh, an engineer in the Second World War, and he was kind of part of delivering radar, um, so we could see him, we could see aircraft, you know, 2,000, 2,500 um, kilometers away. Um, and I love it because it kind of works with what we wanted to do. And we kind of set the project up, and we looked at what we were, what we needed to achieve, and we're kind of talking to our to our managers and grown-ups and saying, like, look, this is what we think we need to do. Um, and, and about halfway through the project, we kind of realized that we just have to be a little bit more flexible. We had to just be comfortable with there being errors, and the errors were in a controlled way. Um, and, and rather than trying to make everything perfect every time, we've, we felt like we were just going to be there forever. Um, th there's a bunch of other kind of internal reasons why we did that. But for us, we were kind of like slowly, slowly trudging along. And then we kind of just said, you know what? We just have to be OK with some error. We have to be OK with there being some noise in what's happening because of the sheer volume that we're doing. As long as we record our, uh, we record our records in a way that clearly flags, uh, flags the machine did this work, um, we know we can go back and clean if we want to. We know there's a reason. It's kind of justifying itself in the record. Um, and we could suddenly start moving with a little bit of pace and speed. So for me, that kind of allowing yourself to be as wrong as we are wrong with humans doing human processing, we're allowed to be wrong. It's okay, it doesn't have to be perfect every time. Um, and that really, for me, was, um, was, was my kind of like third favorite tool um, that we used in this project. And now I'm gonna hand you to Richard, thank you. Kia ora everyone, um, I'm Rich. Um, I'm the collection des description librarian, um, also known as a cataloger at the National Library. Uh, this role involves obviously cataloging individual publications, um, but uh, more and more we're working on projects like this one here to um, generate records in bulk. 
Um, the records we do create, they're encoded in MARC format, and we follow the um, RDA cataloging guidelines. Um, I also catalog digital music as part of my regular work, um, so individually cataloging digital releases that we collect, which is um, always interesting, and um, I get to basically hear the New Zealand's music coming into our collection. All the little niches and subgenres out there, for example, Dungeon Synth, has anyone heard of that? Wow. <laughs> um, sludge Metal, that's a great one too. Um, it never stops fascinating me, this work. Um, I'm a, there's only a handful of um, catalogers in our team that actually do this digital music cataloging as well. And um, currently we describe between 1,000 and 1,500 digital releases a year. So given that current resourcing and um, not considering regular workflow, it would take at least five years to catalogue this DRM project. Um, so obviously that's not going to be feasible like, like we've talked about. Um, so I'm going to talk about two, two aspects, two main pieces of work today. Um, yeah, matching to existing records so that we can use those and building new records. So we, be, we began each phase looking for existing records to use. Um, prior to this project, we had about 9,500 uh, digital music releases in our collection. So it's highly likely that we have quite a few um, in this set already. Um, to find these existing records, we, we wanted to use an automated approach. As, and we needed to, um, to do more than that. We needed to do... Um, use methods to handle the variation in metadata between the two sets of metadata that we're working with. So we've got uh, spreadsheets from DRM and the records that we've catalogued over time. Um, for example, yeah, my name could be recorded in different ways. Um, so exact matching wouldn't work in this case, or very well. To solve this, Jay, Jay wrote a uh, script to compare the metadata in the DRM master spreadsheet. It's the first spreadsheet, um, first phase spreadsheet, with all uh, digital music records in our collection. Uh, it pulled the, out the title, artist, and track list strings for each release, then used fuzzy matching to compare how similar those strings were with those in the bib records. Um, the process returned a fuzzy score. So between 0 and 100, and um, with 100 being identical match between the string. If the fuzzy score was over a set threshold for all strings, for all title, artists, and track lists, then we would say it's a, identified as a potential, potential match. So this is just a kind of example of what this looks like. Um, you can see the fuzzy score there with uh, the title two slightly different titles, and it's got a score of 92. And with artist and track names, um, as the difference in string increases, the score decreases. Um, so you can see it was um, important to set a good threshold so that we got good matches. And basically through trial and error, we, we sort of worked out that it would, at about 70, uh, at about a score of 70 and above, you'd get a reasonably good match. So applying, applying fuzzy matching enabled us to catch a wider, much wider set of possible existing records to use. And um, then it was sort of on cataloging staff, me and my colleagues, to kind of make a decision, is that actually a good match? And you know, we have all these rules around, if, is it the same publisher, is it the same year, and all this sort of stuff. Um, but having this kind of data here was really useful to kind of make that decision quickly. And so we, the result was we found over 500 records, and this is just an example of one in the catalogue. Um, as Jay said, we used Fuzzy throughout the project as well, and, and it became an integral tool to um, detupe the different phases and um, locating physical records to copy metadata from into the digital records. Where we couldn't uh, 
match with the existing records, we needed to create new records. So this involved using multiple sources of metadata to populate custom record templates. And I'll just give a brief overview of that process using the example of the master spreadsheet, which had all the good information from DRM. So the first, the first step starts with looking at our standard practice for cataloging digital music and making decisions on the available metadata and where it could be used. So this here is a custom record template and um, you can see just full of text for title artists and so on. Um, and we created multiple templates to handle variation in the available metadata for each phase. So the next step, uh, Jay wrote a script to generate records by reading the uh, master spreadsheet and populating the record template for each release. So you can see the, the spreadsheet metadata there just as a kind of snapshot. Um, the script used PyMark to um, create mark data. Um, and we had some fine tuning to kind of work out issues as we created the records and there was a bit of back and forth between us. Um, Mark can get very um, pedantic, I think that's probably a good word. Um, so once that was sorted, uh, the record was created in our library management system via the API. Um, and at this point, the record now has a record ID which can be used to uh, link the ingested item to our library management system. So linking the digital archive to the library management system And this is an example of one of the fullest type of records that we generated um, in the catalogs. This is a catalog view, um, the front end catalog, I, I should say. Um, we adopted an approach to our work that the records don't have to be finished the first time we created them as well. We can do extra passes to update the records. Um, for example, I automated copying metadata from matching physical records we'd created. So we've described CDs and vinyl records for matching titles, um, copying, automating the copying of that metadata into the digi digital records. And so you can see a contributor, or possibly at the back, you might not be able to see, but contributor with some names there, and they're clickable links that will bring up other items in our collection for, for those artists. At the other end of the scale is really brief records that we created. Um, this is where we had very little metadata at all to um, create records. So as you can see, there's not really much there, but it's keyword searchable and they're easily identifiable in our systems if we do wanted to revisit them at some point. Um, yeah. So yeah, again, hammering that point, um, being okay with imperfection. Um, and that, that short record was a good example of that. As a cataloger, it's quite hard. <laughs> um, you want to see these records kind of full and, and consistent with the rest of the records in the, the collection. But um, yeah, obviously that's not feasible if it's gonna take five, seven years or whatever to, to do that. Um, so yeah, we did make uh, decisions on what was good enough to progress the work forward and it's something we're growing more comfortable with on uh, these bulk project projects. And I think um, the benefit of automating, automating stuff has been kind of shown as well in this talk. Um, the good thing is many of these tools we can continue to apply in future projects and um, or adapt in different ways as well. And finally, um, it's been a, a good project to work on for me personally. I've had the time and space to try things out to solve problems and um, I've continued to develop my own kind of coding skills as well, which has had some good benefits in terms of already being able to see problems and, and um, you know, create scripts that can identify issues with our records across the whole of the National Library catalogue. So that's been fun. Um, 
yeah, so I'm just really thankful um, for, for Jay's work on this project and for our colleagues and managers um, supporting that kind of approach as well. Yeah, so that's it. thanks everyone for listening. Thank you very much, um, Jane Budget. Um, we've got quite a bit of time left for any questions you may have. Are we willing to answer? <laughs> Um, I've got, <coughs> Sorry. I've got two questions. Actually, I've got three questions. Did um, is amplifier non-existent? I came in late. Or does it still exist? It doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. Talk about this. So two questions. The um, do do you you said you used um, discogs? So I just wonder whether you um, are writing into your Mark Records discog IDs or Music Brains IDs. Those other. That's straight now. No, oh, yeah, we, we went. So really, the so really, the question is why aren't you? But we can keep that for another day. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the other question is um, about internal metadata. A lot of these will have um, ID two, ID three tags. Were you extracting those? Are you writing those? Or is that a question for another day? Uh, no, I can I can talk to that. Um, some of them did, most of them didn't. Actually, a lot of it was WAV, and it didn't have any metadata at all. And because the MP3s were, were born out of their CMS, they hadn't written ID3 into a lot of the MP3 either. So we kind of looked at it, and it just wasn't it wasn't um, generating good enough um, consistent results to, to make it worth kind of leveraging that. There's kind of you know a few files had it in there. We also are not writing that because it's not the process that we use. So we would have taken that we we took the best quality. Um, so just to give you some insight into kind of how complex some of this stuff was, for one simple um, album, we might have had maybe 12 WAVs and a JPEG image. Um, happy days, that's super easy. Another one, we might have had three versions, and inside each of those versions, there were three versions of the audio, so an M uh, mastered for iTunes, the um, CD audio, and the website MP3. And so there was a little bit of bouncing around to figure those out. So just g given the complexity of all of those things, we were frankly uh, lucky to find the kind of registered item sanely um, and, and, and that kind of was a, a different process. Once we handed that off, um, we either, it goes into the NDHA kind of system and, and we generate MP3s for everything as a rote process and there isn't a plugin that, that, that writes stuff in. We're not cataloging at the track level, we're cataloging at the works level, so a single EP album, what have you. So at the project kind of level we often knew what the track was called but by the time it becomes an object that that that's kind of gone because we're not atomically working at a track so it would be nice to do we probably should do it um we don't and that, that some of the reasons are is the added kind of labor around that and then also the one that gets consumed predominantly happens um well away from the record anyway if that makes sense to answer your question Cool. I, I, I like the way you said you probably should do it, and I think yeah. I agree with that. Cool. And I think you should probably do the music brains thing as well. Uh, that's a, another problem for catalogers and on me, so I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Any questions? Uh, th there was a question about where is this stuff. It's on GitHub. I forget which one of my accounts it's under. Um, I don't know how to socialise. I'll probably tweet it with the NDF hashtag or something. So if it's interesting, just look out for a tweet from... Oh, I don't even know what my Twitter account is. <laughs> something. <laughs> I think it's ND, oh, NDH. Oh, I'm not using that one at the moment because of reasons. Um, I'll find a way. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure it is somehow on, on um, Twitter reasons. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Thanks again, Jay and Richard. And it's now afternoon tea time. Get some refreshment in Oceania.